Tonight, as we come to the Word, we come to a very important portion. If you have your Bibles, turn to the sixth chapter of Ephesians with me, if you would. We come tonight to verse 10 in our continuing series in Ephesians. And this begins a very, very famous and very, very important section of this epistle dealing with the armor of the Christian in his warfare. Now, in verse 10, the Apostle Paul lays down a very, very basic thought to Christian living. Very, very important thought. He is about to bring this entire epistle to a close. We're kind of winding it up now. He has presented his basic thesis already. And you know that his basic thesis is to present, first of all, the position of the believer. And secondly, the believer's practice. What you are and how you ought to act. That's the key to the book of Ephesians. Positionally, you'll remember in chapters 1, 2, and 3, he has spoken of all that belongs to the Christian. All spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. He has detailed very carefully our positional resources. He has spoken of the great purpose of God in Christ creating a body. He has spoken of the glory of our high calling and the mystery of our union with other believers. He has talked about our place in God's family and the fact that we are the habitation of the Spirit. Then practically, he also has given us the details of how to live this new life. Practicing our position. He gave us standards for unity, standards for body, life, and ministry, standards for fellowship with others in the body, standards for witnessing to the world, the basic design for the home, all of these things in order that we might really be able to practice our position, in order that we might be what we are. And we have been studying the area of the practice for a long time, and we have gone over certain principles that are very important to us as believers. And in studying the concepts of the worthy walk, we have seen that the worthy walk, beginning in chapter 4, the practical part of Ephesians, deals with six areas. The worthy walk is a different walk, not like the world. It is a love walk. It is a light walk. It is a wise walk. It is a Holy Spirit walk. We've considered all of those. Tonight we will consider that the Christian walk is a warfare walk, a warfare walk. And this is very important for us to understand. This is kind of the cap on everything. With all of these other practical injunctions in mind, we must be reminded finally that the Christian life is to be lived with a real knowledge that we are in an intense and relentless spiritual battle. When a person receives Jesus Christ and has made a new creation, he is chosen out of the hating world, John 15 says. And at that point, he enters into a war against that world and what's behind it that is unceasing. It continues all his life long. And thus we say that his walk is a warfare walk. A warfare walk is a walk that is very circumspect. It is a walk that is very careful. It is a walk that is very sure to search out every area to make sure the enemy is not there. The believer's walk must be one that is very serious-minded, that is very sober-minded, that is a watching walk, where he must be on the lookout constantly for the adversary. And so the Christian is not sort of uh, tipping through the meadow blissfully. He is walking among mines and snipers and flying bullets, all sent by the enemy. He is in the midst of a real, intense, unceasing, relentless war. That's part of his warfare. Now, to the Christian then, his very existence is war. It's battle all the way, from beginning to end. We have an enemy that is hell-bent on our destruction. And that enemy is none other than the devil himself and all of his hosts. And he often works his attacks against us through the world system. So what is Paul saying here in conclusion in his little epistle? He is saying we are a body in battle. 
We are a body in battle. And you know, whenever there's wartime, that makes everything else all the more strategic. That makes every practical aspect all the more important because war heightens the intensity of everything. And so it is for the Christian that we are in the midst of a war. God's children are not only servants, God's children are soldiers. Paul, in fact, summed up his life with these words. I have fought the good fight. Paul knew that his life was a battle from the moment he received Christ until the moment he died and went to be with Christ. It never ceased being a very literal, a very actual, and a very intense war. In fact, Paul had to remind Timothy of it in 2 Timothy 2.3. He said, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians, a very interesting passage, chapter 10 and verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In other words, we are not battling with fleshly enemies. We are in a spiritual warfare. In fact, in Philippians 2.25, the Apostle Paul calls Epaphroditus his, quote, fellow soldier. So the Christian life is viewed, among many other metaphors, as a war. And we know from John 15 that our enemy is the system. It is the evil cosmos that the world is perhaps the, the most obvious front on which the battle is raged. The hostile, Christ-hating, evil system that crucified Christ and desires to destroy everyone who names his name is our most obvious enemy. And Paul had experienced this, even as he's writing here to Ephesus, when he talks about the believer's war, he is undoubtedly reflecting on some of the things that he experienced, even in Ephesus, some of the things that he went through as a believer. In verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 16, for example, he says, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, listen, and many adversaries. Many adversaries. And he had many adversaries in Ephesus. The people in the city were really upset when he went there and when he declared Christ. You see, they, there was a great goddess in the city of Ephesus by the name of Diana. And everybody worshipped Diana. And in the worship of Diana was much industry. Oh, there were lots of people who were employed in the temple. There were lots of people who were employed in the crafts that made the little goddesses. There were lots of prostitutes employed in the worship of Diana. And when Paul came in and brought in Christianity, he threatened the economics of Ephesus. And so when he declared that there was only one true God and that man could only know that one true God through Christ, the Ephesians rose up in anger to throw him out of the city and to kill him because he belittled Diana and threatened their economic and religious security. So Paul's adversaries were in the first line, visible, human, and incidentally, vulnerable. And in a sense, for the Christian, the first enemy that we see is the hating world, isn't it? But wonderful promise, wonderful promise. In 1 John... Chapter 5, it tells us that we have overcome that enemy. We've overcome the evil system. 1 John 5, 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. Listen, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcometh the world. Did you get that? Whatever is born of God overcometh the world. Verse 5, Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So at the moment of salvation, we really knock off that first enemy. Salvation causes us to be lifted out of the world. The system. Now, the things of the world may still attract us. 
but we are no longer part of its system of the world. We have been removed from that system. But my friends, there is a greater enemy behind that. There is a greater enemy behind the evil system. There is a spiritual adversary, the real slanderer, the real diabolos accuser. And he and his forces are the ones that are really set to destroy us. And if they can't get us through the evil system, he will seek to get us some other way. And this passage details that real spiritual enemy and how we can defeat him. It bypasses the problem of the world because the world is taken care of at salvation, the evil system. We're removed from that in a positional sense. But Satan then works all the harder to get us. And I want to show you five things that we need to understand if we're going to fight an effective battle. Number one, the preparation. If we're going to fight in the war, we've got to know how to get ready. Number two, the armor. We've got to know what we need to be victorious. Number three, the enemy. We have to understand who our enemy is, and we have to understand, fourthly, the battle, how he works. And fifthly, we'll understand the victory and how it comes. First of all, I want you to notice the preparation, and that we read in verse 10. Here is how we prepare ourselves for battle. Finally, my brethren, when it's all said and done, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. As always, let me say this, as always, the battle belongs to the strong, right? As always. So Paul thus begins in talking about the warfare walk, with an exhortation to spiritual strength. The battle always belongs to the strong. And thus he says, be strong. Notice he says, my brethren, soldiers in arms, you know, the common cause. Be strong. And notice twice he uses the word in, in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now I want you to catch that because it's important. He does not say that we are to ask for strength. He says we are to count on the strength that is ours in Christ. Do you see that? Be strong in the Lord. It's there. The repository of strength is already available in the Lord. He doesn't say ask for strength. He just says be strong in the Lord. When you're in Christ, you have that strength available, and the power of his might is already yours. We don't need to beg for power. We only need to recognize that power is already ours in the Lord and use it and apply it. That's all he's saying. Accept what you have and use it. In Philippians 4.13, he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Already done. The fact that he knows Christ gives him an unlimited resource of energy and power. And the word power, dunamis, from which we get our word dynamite. Explosive kind of power, dynamic kind of power. The Lord has already gained the victory on the cross. On the cross, Jesus Christ dealt the crushing death blow of the head of Satan. He destroyed the devil in dying, Hebrews tells us. The victory has already been won. All the believer ever needs to do is to charge through where Christ has already won and claim his power. Just tap your divine resources. You say, well, I don't know how much power I've got. I don't know just what I can do. Well, I'll show you. In chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 16, he says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. See? The power that you can know in the spirit of God is fantastic. And Paul says, I want you guys to be strengthened by the Spirit that's in you. I want you to claim that strength. I want you to count on that strength to defeat the enemy. Just how much strength it is is given to us in verse 20. Unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all, we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Listen, there's so much power in there you can do beyond what you can even dream. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says to Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You've already got it, now be strong in it. You see, tap it. Use that strength that is yours. And I'm sure there's a great emphasis 
on the word his in chapter 6, verse 10. We are to be strong in the power of his might. His might, not our own. So we can't fight the battle alone. This is where it all begins. Our preparation must be the tapping of the resources of the power of the Lord that is in us. And so what we say then is this, that the word be strong doesn't mean strengthen yourself, flex your own muscles, and make yourself into a model fighting man at all. It simply uses, he uses the form here, really, Paul does, that shows that they are to receive strength, the passive, see, receive strength from another. Just relax and let him give you his power. Let him give you his strength. In fighting a human battle or a human war, for example, strength is evaluated in terms of manpower. How many men the commander can rally, or strength may be based on the idea of the, of the brilliance of the general or the brilliance of his soldiers. And a very brilliant soldier, a very brilliant general, perhaps is stronger than one not so sharp. Or maybe the strength of the human army is based upon how many weapons they have and, and the character of those weapons and how devastating they are. But in a spiritual warfare, Paul says a Christian really enters into the conflict with no strength, very, very limited weapons in terms of what we would think would be needed, and no real wisdom except that which is given him of the Lord. And that's because God wants him to totally and completely rely on his power. Look at chapter 1, verse 19. And the question comes up at this point as to how great this power really is. In verse uh, 19 it says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now, what is he saying? He's saying, how powerful is this? How strong is this power? How really mighty is it? And he says it's the same mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's the kind of power we have in, in the Lord. That's a lot of power. Resurrection power. Power to do beyond what we can dream, we ought, beyond what we can imagine. In fact, the Paul says to the Colossians in Colossians 1.11, strengthened with all might, all might, invincible kind of power. Jesus said to the disciples in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and every believer has power. You have dynamite, dunamis. So God's best soldiers are those who know their weakness, who do not rely on their own strength, but wholly on his strength. I think David was like this. David, when he got up against the Philistines and Goliath, you know, that wasn't, that was a pretty strange situation. One little fellow like David against Goliath, this great huge monster. And David's comment was very simple. David said this, the battle is the Lord's. It's not mine. It's the Lord's battle. See? David had divinely inspired stones. The Holy Spirit, one occasion, said to Jehoshaphat and all Judea and Jerusalem, the same thing the Spirit said, the battle is not yours, it's God's. All you got to do is show up. And you know what happened in that battle? With Jehoshaphat, all the enemy got together and killed each other. The battle was the Lord. That's how it is with us. He is our strength. The battle isn't even ours, it's His. He's already opened the way we just walk through. All right, so there we find first the preparation. And now we'll detail this. Secondly, by looking at the armor. Verse 11, first part. Put on the whole armor of God. Now, this is good. This is good. When Paul wrote this letter, he was a prisoner. He was a Roman prisoner. And it is very likely that the soldier who was keeping Paul was, in fact, even chained to him in some fashion. May not have been, but that is possible. But nevertheless, we do know that Paul was captured and held by a Roman soldier. And as Paul is writing this wonderful letter, he is undoubtedly aware of this soldier. And as he describes the armor of the Lord, he probably in his mind is viewing this soldier that is right with him. 
And it's interesting that he wasn't guarded by a soldier in a, you know, a nice toga. But evidently it was guarded by a soldier who was completely equipped militarily, totally outfitted, because his job was as an active soldier, not an inactive. The fully equipped soldier then presented to the mind of Paul an object lesson. And the object lesson is simple. He says to the believer, put on the whole armor of God. Don't lounge around in your spiritual toga. You see, this is not a life of ease, people. Get it on, right? All of it on. This is war. This is war. Put on the whole armor of God. Incidentally, the, the phrase put on, the construction in the Greek is a put on once and for all. The verb is used in a final sense. Put on once and for all the armor of God. This is no um, on again, off again skirmish. You don't retire from the battle ever as a Christian. The war goes on all the time, 24 hours a day, all through your existence on earth. We need the whole armor of God. We cannot face the battle with anything missing. Anything. Because Satan will know exactly where we are lacking armor, and that's exactly where he'll shoot his fiery darts. So we put it all on and leave it on. The Christian life is a war that is unceasing and relentless. We can never lay aside our armor or we become vulnerable immediately. Now, what are the pieces of armor? Well, if you look at verse 14, I'll just read them to you and then we'll study them in weeks to come. Stand therefore having your loins girded about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, with which ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now there he details the pieces of armor. It's interesting to note there's none for the back. The believer is never in retreat or he's done. He's had it. He's had it. If there was, it would be the back plate of cowardice. And for a Christian, there can be no such thing. And so we're always standing face to face with the adversary. So he speaks to the importance of the armor. You've got to put it all on and you've got to leave it on. Put it on is put on in a final sense. And the whole armor, you can't be without any part of it or you're vulnerable. All right, so that's the armor. We've seen the preparation in the army. Now, I want, armor, I want to show you now the enemy. And this is really going to be important. The enemy. In the middle of verse 11. That she may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the devil is our enemy. Devil means slanderer, accuser. He is called Satan in Scripture. The adversary. And incidentally, we believe that the devil is a real personality. That the devil does exist as a real spiritual personality. In 1 Peter, I think it's chapter 5, in verse 8, it says this. Be sober, that means, you know, aware, looking around, carefully analyzing, watching your priorities, observing what's happening. Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. That's talking about Christians there. That's not talking about unbelievers. That's talking about believers. Satan wants to chew up believers. He wants to devour them. That is to rob them of their testimony. To shred their Christian life and witness. The devil is a very personal enemy. A very real antagonist. Now, who is the devil? Well, I don't want to go into the whole thing on the theology of angels and Satan, but let me say this. That the devil is formerly, was formerly, the highest of angels. His name was Lucifer. And he was the ruler of angels as closely as we can tell. The most beautiful of all angels ever created. A fantastic being 
you want to read a description of him, read Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28, and you'll see him very graphically described in a magnificent beauty. And he decided that he wanted to be what God was and run the whole show, and he started a rebellion against God, and God threw him out of heaven, and he became Satan, the adversary. He became the devil, the slanderer, the accuser. And he didn't fall all by himself. He fell with one-third of the angels, Revelation 12 tells us. And this whole force, this whole realm of unclean spirits is then set militantly against God, Christ, and everyone who names the name of Christ. And our real enemy is none other than Diabolos, the devil himself, and all of his fiendish demons that inhabit this world and the atmosphere around this world. And his effect is fantastic. In Ephesians 2, 2, it says, In which time past ye walked according to the course of this world, and everybody who does walks according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the sons of disobedience. Every unbeliever, every unbeliever is operated by the devil himself. He functions in response to the energy of Satan. If you're a part of the system, you're run by the devil. Just that simple. And that's hard for people to understand, but it's true. And it's not that he cares about you. You're really his dupe. He wants to use you in his revolt against God and then discard you in hell when he's done with you. And so here is the devil, the ruler of darkness, the prince of this world. And he is our enemy. And my friends, we must know our enemy. We aren't smart and we aren't sharp enough to know our enemy and how he hits, then we're the loser when the attacks come. Having been cast out of heaven, Satan is filled with fury. He is filled with anger. He hates God with a hellish venom. He desires to overthrow God. He desires to overthrow Jesus Christ. He desires to overthrow all people and put them all in hell that was originally prepared by God for him and his angels, not for people at all. He is a roaring lion and moves among believers, seeking which of believers he can devour. And he has a powerful and well-organized army of demons. And he has established an outpost in the heart of every unbeliever. And that makes him busy, and that makes him everywhere. Although he's not omnipresent, his activity goes on every place. He is behind every ungodly act. Everything that destroys what God has built up is of the devil of the devil. And so there's our enemy. And don't be foolish enough to think that he's not real. Don't be foolish enough to think that he's not a real personality because he is. But praise God, his, his attempts are going to be short-lived and ultimately he's going to be judged. And Paul said, Satan shall be put under your feet. Subjection. All right, so that's basically an introduction to the enemy. Now I want to show you the battle strategy. I want you to see how Satan hits. Here's the battle in verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that's the armor, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the devil being the enemy. His strategy, verse 11, are called wiles, W-I-L-E-S. His attacks begin with wiles. That's how his attacks start. Now, this is an interesting word. The word wiles comes from a basic word that means to stalk. S-T-A-L-K. That is to stalk as an animal would. Stalk its prey. To pursue with a view to devour. It suggests an animal, as I say, just kind of seeking its prey. And that's what Satan does, cleverly, with stealth, deceitfully, with great cunning and great skill, not blatantly, not flagrantly, not openly, but in a very subtle fashion, he stalks his prey with craft, guile, deceit, and subtlety like a predatory lion waiting for the right moment, the surprise to attack. But now, specifically, what are the wiles of the devil? And I want you to understand this because I think it's very important. The word is 
methodia, from which we get word, the word methods. And it is used in chapter 4 and verse 14. And I think if we compare the two, we'll get a good idea of what it means. Chapter 4 and 14, talking about spiritual maturity coming to the fullness of the stature of Christ. We want to grow up, we want to be fully statured men and equal to Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and, here comes our friend again, cunning craftiness. That's the word methodia again, wiles. And he, who is the guy behind that? Satan. Not only the slight of men, but the methodia again, the wiles again, the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. Now notice the nature of verse 14, friends. The area of Satan's attack, I think, is hinted in chapter 4, verse 14. Verse 14 deals with market doctrinal error. Do you see it there? He says, I don't want you anymore tossed about with every wind of doctrine by the wiles, you see. And so now when we move over to chapter 6 and we look at verse 11 and we see the word wiles again, then we remember that last time we saw that word, it was connected with false doctrine. And I believe we are then on the right road to really understand where Satan's attacks come. I personally believe that Satan's attacks come in the area of doctrinal error, heresy, false doctrine, the doctrines as they are called in 1 Timothy 4.1, the doctrines of devils or demons. Satan is opposed to truth. Back in 4.15, it talked about the opposite of this, is to speak the truth in love. Satan is the one who comes with doctrinal lies, false teaching, false doctrine, false truth. These are the wiles of the devil. If you can get somebody to believe a false doctrine, you can get him to go out and sin against God. False doctrine covers a lot of things. Atheism is false doctrine. And if Satan can convince a man to be an atheist, he can make a hedonist out of the man if Satan could take a Christian and convince him that some doctrines aren't important, he can get that Christian to violate those truths, and thus he can get him to sin. And his testimony can be destroyed. So Satan works in the area of false doctrine. And I'll show you another illustration. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, again illustrates the same thing. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now, there you have a definition of Satan. He is an angel of light, as an angel of light, transformed into an angel of light. What does that mean? That means he comes along sounding good. He's religious, but behind it are the doctrines of demons. And backing up to verse 13, Paul talks about false teachers, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder or no marvel, for that's what Satan is, an angel of light. Jesus said he is a liar and the father of lies. And he always goes around propagating his lies. And whether it's a small doctrinal error that causes a believer to fall into sin or a gigantic doctrinal error that comes out as one of the false systems and religions of the world, it's all the same. It's all satanic. And whether you, you happen to be a bushman somewhere worshiping a monkey or whether you happen to be somebody who goes to a liberal church, quote, unquote, worshiping Jesus Christ, the hell that you'll experience may be the same and perhaps greater for the one who worships the Christ that the devil has fabricated who is not Christ at all. And his wiles, then, are matters of lies doctrinally. Doctrinally. That's why, you see, well, it's Galatians 1.8. It just bangs right on the same thought. It says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Do you know another angel from heaven that preaches another gospel? I do. I know a lot of them, not personally, but I know they're out there. Satan is an angel from heaven who preaches another doctrine, another gospel. Let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. He is always engaged in false doctrine. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it says this, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, 
Here's his character. Who deceiveth the whole world. You see? That's always what he does. That's always what he does. He deceives. He lies. He propagates false truth. He gets you to believe if you do that, ah, it won't matter anyway, go do it. He always lies. He always propagates his falsehoods. In the Old Testament, Satan got Israel to worship idols, and look what it did to them. In the New Testament, Satan deceived the Jews into believing that Jesus Christ was a heretic, and they killed him, and look what that cost them. And they were so mixed up, they were listening to the devil, and they couldn't figure out who Jesus was, and Jesus speaks to them in such strong language in John 8. Let me just read you that little section. Ye do the deeds of your father, he said. Then said they to him, We are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And Jesus says in verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the less of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. There's the character. Because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. And, of course, you know what their reaction was? Verse 48. Then answered the Jews and say unto him, Say we not well, thou art a Samaritan and hast a demon. You're devil-possessed. That's what they said to Jesus. Now, who do you think convinced him of that? It worked to his own advantage to convince them that he was a devil-possessed man. The devil actually accepts bad PR to accomplish his purpose. He doesn't care what people think of him as long as they think ill of God and Christ. Always false doctrine. Always false doctrine. That's how he tempted Christ. He perverted the Old Testament. Why? He says, doesn't it say that the angels will, you know, lift you up lest you dash your foot against a stone? Jesus said, you old perverter. (laughs) See, that's his area. His area is heresy and false doctrine. He doesn't concentrate on all that other stuff. In fact, he may even ape God if that works for his benefit. Did you know that? He may even put on robes and step into the pulpit with a Bible if it'll accomplish his purpose. If it'll damn men's souls, he'll do it. And it will. And he does. False prophets. False preachers. That's why I just loathe, loathe people who preach less than Jesus Christ, not for their sake, but for Satan's and what he's doing in them. And as I say, he may even ape God in 2 Thessalonians 2. Shocking. Just shocking. Tells us about it. Talks about the man of sin. The Antichrist who will come in verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now that guy's got a problem. He sits there showing himself that he's God. Satan's behind it. And in verse 9, Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with power and signs and lying wonders. Boy, when the Antichrist comes, Satan's going to set him up as God. He'll ape God if it fits his purpose. He'll take bad PR if it gets what he wants. So he works in false doctrine. Let me show you one other thing that shows us that he works in the area of false doctrine. In 1 John 2, verse 13. I write unto you, fathers, and here you have the three stages of spiritual growth. I write unto you, fathers, that's the maturist kind of Christian, because you have known him that is from the beginning. He has a full orb theological knowledge. He understands the eternity of God and so forth. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. Spiritual babes, you know what they know? They know God. That's it. A spiritual babe is one who doesn't know doctrine. Are you ready for this? A spiritual babe is one who doesn't know doctrine. A spiritual young man is one who has learned doctrine. If he has thus learned sound doctrine, He has overcome the wicked one. Why? Because the wicked one concentrates his energies in the area of false doctrine. Do you see? Do you see? He is saying you have overcome the wicked one. If you have reached a place where you know the Word of God, where doctrinally you are secure, where you understand the truths of the Word of God, where you are solid doctrinally, according to that verse, you have overcome the wicked one. It's a beautiful concept. You say, well, does that mean I'm sinless? No, no, no. You overcame the world when you were saved, right? All that are born of God have overcome the world. When you reach the level of spiritual young man, you overcome the devil. Who's left? Or what's left? The flesh. And it really goes. And the Bible says you can overcome the world and overcome the wicked one, but nowhere will you ever read you can overcome the flesh. Only one way to overcome the flesh. I offer it to you. Die. 
and you go to be with the Lord. That's the only way. And so he's saying here then that it is characteristic of a young man, one who has reached the level of spiritual understanding, that he has overcome the wicked one. In other words, he has no problems with the attacks of false doctrine. A spiritual babe is vulnerable, aren't they? That's why we need to be with them. You know, we always say when somebody gets saved, we've got to follow them up, right? Teach them, nurture them, love them, instruct them, because the devil will move in to try to destroy he will move in to feed false doctrine, and they get all tangled up and all messed up into all kinds of things. And so we need to nurture them until they reach the level of a young man and have overcome the attacks of Satan in the area of false doctrine. Now, in case you're still having a problem with this, let me show you something. People will say, you know, I went out and did a terrible sin, and the devil made me do it. And I went out and did a terrible sin, and, and oh, Satan really made me do it. No, 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 not, not Satan. Now watch this. Look at the end of the book of Galatians in the fifth chapter. Verse 19. Now we'll just see if it's the devil. Verse 19, Galatians 5, page 1270, says this. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Doesn't say the works of the devil, does it? The works of the flesh. What are they? Adultery, fornication, that's sexual uncleanness. Then uncleanness, which is impurity, kind of a general thing. Lasciviousness, uh, that's wantonness, no restraints at all, just wild perversion, idolatry, sorcery, sorcery is interesting, hatred, strife, jealousy, wrath, factions, seditions, heresy, envying, murder, drunkenness, wild parties, you know, carousing around, all that stuff is of the flesh, do you see that? You can overcome the devil doctrinally and still have a lot of things going on in the flesh. You can't, you don't have to say every time, oh, I sinned a sin, the devil did it, the devil was tempted. That wasn't necessarily the devil. The devil doesn't have to mess with you in that area. Your flesh will take good care of you. Now, he's behind the activation of that, but that's the flesh. His direct attack comes in the area of doctrine. That's why when you reach the age of a young man spiritually and have reached the level of maturity, you have overcome the wicked one doctrinally in terms of his direct frontal attacks because you know what you believe. So Satan's, Satan's wiles, then, are lies and false doctrine, which he uses to deceive in an effort to devour the believer. And that's, that's why we speak so strongly and so openly against false doctrine. I, I tell you, friends, whether it's the false doctrine in the form of the new morality or the form of cults or false sects, or modernism, or false religions, or whatever it is, false doctrine is to be blasted with a fierceness that is reserved for the things from hell, because that's what it is. They are the devil's damning lies. Now notice what he says, because what are you going to do about this kind of an attack? That's the end of verse 11, that you may be able to, what? Stand, that's all. All you need to do is be sure that you're standing true and solid and firm, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, right where you were before the attack. When the smoke clears and the attack's over, you're still there. You haven't moved an inch. That's what it's all about. Having done all, stand there, he says later on down in verse 13. So our, our task isn't to assault the devil. I don't, that's why I don't feel any compulsion to go preaching against the devil all the time. I don't need to assault him. I just want to know that when he's done with me, I'm still where I was when he got there. I don't want to take any backward steps and retreat any ground. I want to hold what I possess for Christ. Hold on to that security of sound truth when he's done. And incidentally, the devil's attacks come in waves. They come roll in and smash, and then James says, you resist the devil, and he does what? He flees, but he'll be back. In the next wave, boom, and you resist, and he flees again. All right, now that's the beginning of his attack. It's in the area of false doctrine, and all we're asked to do is to stand firm against it. Christ has won the victory. We don't have to conquer any more than he conquered. He conquered all there was to conquer. All we've got to do is hold the territory that he conquered. In our lives. All right, then verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Boy, this is a fantastic verse. We wrestle. Isn't that something? 
You know, that enemy gets so close that to stand and hold our ground, we enter into hand-to-hand combat with the devil and his demons. I mean, we really struggle. This is intense. This is strenuous personal conflict. We're engaged in a hand-to-hand death struggle. It's a serious struggle. The enemy is seeking to devour us in order to discredit our testimony. You know how much damage the devil's done by doing that? Having a Christian stand on a certain ground and give a testimony for Christ? Satan comes along and blasts him off that ground. And the people who knew him before say, wait, what is that? See, I thought he named the name of Christ. I thought he was this and he was that. Look at him, see. How many ministers and how many people in Christian ministries have you known who have been so discredited and their ministries just just completely destroyed because they have become vulnerable? And so we are to stand. And when Satan attacks, we are to get into this conflict intensely. Christian life is no picnic. It's a struggle. And if you're going to hold your ground, you're going to have to fight him hand to hand. All right, now notice this. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, we're not, this is no human enemy. We're not hassled with people. People we can handle. You know, they're equal to us. That's no problem. Our foe isn't even human. That's what makes him so tough, you see. We're fighting the foe we can't even see. We're fighting the one that we can't even touch. It's like, uh, as I read in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, you see, because we've got to get up there in the heavenlies. If we had a... It, let's look at this. If we had a physical enemy, maybe our own strength would help. But since the enemy's spiritual, it doesn't do us any good to count on our own strength, does it? So we've got to be strong in his power and his might to fight an enemy who is spiritual. Now, Satan does use humans. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, he says here, but Satan uses humans to carry out his work. He started in Genesis 3, and he's still using people too. In fact, John says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, that the whole world lies in the arms of the wicked one. He uses people. He uses the world as, as his dupes, as his tools sometimes, but the real enemy is superhuman. We're fighting a supernatural enemy. We're not wrestling against humans. We're wrestling against principalities and powers, a supernatural host of evil spirits. The devil and his demons, and he's got a lot of them. One third of all the angels went when he went. There's plenty of them. Now, the demons kind of run in different courses. There are different kinds of demons. There are loose fallen angels called demons, and there are bound fallen angels. And of the bound fallen angels, there are two kinds, temporarily bound and permanently bound. Some of them are bound forever. Others will be loose during the tribulation. Remember when the earth opens up and the demons come out? So there are various ranks and various kinds of demons. And these demons are our enemies. As I say, some of the demons are bound right now in the, in the abyssos. Remember the abyss. Remember when Jesus cast the demons out of the demoniac? They said to him, please don't send us to the abyssos, the place for bound demons. So he sent them into the swine. On another occasion, we know about demons. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and Jude 6, where the demons are, in fact, bound. So there are two types of demons. Some are bound, some are loose. The bound ones aren't any problem at this point. The loose ones are. You say, well, do the demons know what they're doing? Oh, yeah, they know what they're doing. Do you know that demons know you? Oh, they know you. If you're an aggressive Christian, I believe they know you by name. And I believe you hassle them a lot. I believe if you're really living for the Lord, they say, oh, that guy, he really gets, he messes up what we're trying to do. You say, McCarthy, that's really using your imagination. No, it isn't. It's right in Acts 19. It tells us this. In Acts 19, verse 11, listen to this. This is really good. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought into the sick uh, handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Here's Paul just casting out demons, see? Now watch this. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, they had some of these uh, mediums, like we have today. Witches and mediums and exorcists, you know, throwing out demons, supposedly. They took upon them to call over them who had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. You know what they did? They tried to get in on the Christians, on Paul's power to cast out demons. They said, Hey, that looks like a good way to do it. Let's do it. So they got some people who were demons that say, all right, we say to you, in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches, come out. They were messing around in the wrong territory. That didn't belong to them. And this is really good. 
And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Now, you don't think they don't know who we are? They don't know who their people are, but they know who we are. They don't need to know who's already in their camp. They want to know who to fight against. And don't be foolish enough to think that you can be a believer and the demons won't know it. So that's the battle. And it's an intense struggle, and it's not just a physical enemy, but against battalions of fallen angels who are great in power and who would destroy us in any way they could, primarily through false doctrine, false teaching, getting us to believe a lie. Getting us to believe you can go out and sin and God won't mind, you're under grace. Getting us to believe that this isn't the right truth here and you can violate that principle because it's, it's not really the right interpretation anyway. Getting you to believe anything that is untrue. And may I say that they're well organized? Notice it says there are principalities and powers. Now, in God's governmental order with his own angels, he has them all organized. There are, for example, archangels, who evidently are the, the highest angels. Gabriel being one. Uh, there are also warrior, warrior angels. The commander-in-chief of all the armies of heaven, his name is Michael. He's the commander-in-chief of the warring angels, carrying on the, the angelic warfare against the demons. And then along the line, from the higher angels, there goes down a whole list, and God's commands come down through the ranks to the final group who carry them out. See, Daniel tells us about that. Angels came, and so forth and so on, carrying out God's messages. And when, when there came a little problem there, Michael had to come down and whack out the demons because they were holding up the process. So there, there are these levels of angels that God has designed. Now, the highest of these are called principalities and powers. Well, Satan doesn't have an original thought in his head except sin. And from then on, he copied God and everything he tried to do. Everything he does is a counterfeit of God. So you can be sure that if God had angels who were principalities and powers, Satan's, Satan's ranks would be the same. So Satan organized his fallen angels under the same kind of categories, and we wrestle against those principalities and powers. Those are names and ranks of angels, high-ranking angels. Now, as I said, he copied God in Ephesians 1.21. It talks about God and Christ who is above all principality and power. And there it's talking about the holy angels. In chapter 3, verse 10, it says that the church is going to be put on display before the principalities and powers in heavenly places. And there again, you see, it's talking about the high-ranking good angels headed up by God, ruled by God. So when Satan organized his own thing, he organized the same kind of thing with principalities and powers. And that's a tremendous thing to realize, that this is an organized system, my friends. This is an organized system. The orders come from Satan through the higher principalities and powers, directed down through the ranks to the, to the fallen angels or demons that carry them out and militate and move against us in the name of Satan. Praise God that Jesus defeated every one of them at the cross. Isn't that tremendous? They're already sentenced. They're just waiting the final incarceration. In Colossians 2.14, it says that Jesus blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. You know what else he did in the next verse? Beautiful. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In what? His cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he sent the demons to hell, in effect. You know what the demons did? They threw everything they had at Jesus on the cross. They threw everything they had at him to kill him on the cross, and he went into the grave and came out the other side of the grave and thus destroyed death, destroyed the devil, and destroyed demons along with it. And someday they'll be sentenced. Then Paul talks about the nature of their work. They're not only principalities and powers, but here's how they work. They are rulers of the darkness of this world. They are spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. They rule this world. They run the evil system. Crime is run by demons. That's right. All the evil system in our world is run by demons. False religion is run by demons. Liberalism is run by demons. False religions around the world are run by demons. Heresy is authored and 
organized and turned into denominationalism often by demons. They run the world system. They operate it. They carry out the evil world orders that Satan gives them. In fact, Paul calls it in Colossians 1.13, he says he delivers us from the power of darkness to the kingdom of his son, as if the power of darkness is a domain all its own. The dark, evil world of Satan's fiends. And my friends, this is the system we wrestle. This is our enemy. They can cripple us. They can. These demons can cripple us. They can render us ineffective. They can buffet us. They can bring us trouble. They can hassle us. They can render our testimony blank. But I want to read you something they can't do. Oh, I like this. Listen to this. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. One thing they can never do is rob us of our salvation. Never. Never. That's a great promise. You say, well, how are we going to effectively wrestle? I mean, if we're in this wrestling deal, I mean, how do we do it effectively? Well, number one, you know your enemy, right? Number two, you acknowledge you have no strength but the Lord's. Are you ready for this? Number three, pray. Pray. Verse 18, see it there? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. You've got to pray, you've got to pray, you've got to pray, see? And I'll tell you the fourth thing. Use the word on them. Jesus did didn't he? He answered Satan three times in Matthew 4, and all three times, what did he use? Use the word. So we see the grim power and resources of our foe. 